Okay, let's pray. Father, your name is above every name. We look to you as our God and King, Lord and Savior, Redeemer, shield and buckler, and our strong tower. Who do we have to look to when there's nothing else working? We say like David, we look to the hills. The hill of the Lord, from whence comes our strength. And so one more time, we look to the hill. Let your word come from the hill. Satisfy our hearts. And Lord, you know I cannot teach, and so I'm going to talk. You teach. For you said in your own constitution that we need no man to teach us. For there is an anointing that abides in us that teacheth us. It is the spirit of truth. So Holy Spirit, thanks for making my job so easy. I'll talk, you teach. For only you can change the human heart. And I trust you to do it right now. And we will give you all the credit for anything accomplished here today. By the authority of the name of the King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shake two hands. Tell them, watch me change right before your eyes today. <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you very much. Wow. It's great to be here again. Thank you very much for the privilege of coming back. Thank you, Bishop Long, for inviting me again three consecutive years in a row. And that really humbles me. It's also great to see so many of my friends. My voice is a little short because I was in Australia and New Zealand for two weeks. And I was speaking like three times, four times a day. So many conferences and seminars. Uh, they invited me by myself. And uh, so I had to do a lot of work. And uh, if any one of you ever been to Australia and New Zealand, you know that they are on another planet. Uh, I always say that when you go to Australia, if the rapture takes place, you will leave first. And then the rest of the world comes behind because they are always a day ahead. But uh, it was a great experience and I thank God for landing back here in the west and in the northern hemisphere. It was 90 degrees down there, Fahrenheit. Very hot. So they are the opposite of the axis of the earth. When it's freezing up north, they are very warm. So it's great to be back to get some balance. Uh, the theme of this conference, by the way, I was sitting in the last two sessions and I'm just so richly blessed by the information that hopefully we all got. And I was so stimulated by the last speaker, especially because he spoke my language. Uh, I have always been driven by the idea that the church should never be supported by tithes and offerings. That has been my motive from the beginning. Uh, all tithes and offerings are supposed to do is maintain the house. Not expand it, nor build it, but maintain it. Uh, the Bible says, bring the tithes to the stalls that there may be meat where? in the house. So if you want growth and expansion, you need some other resources coming in from some other places. And so I want to encourage you to listen to what you heard by those speakers. Uh, what they said were very important. And sometimes it's difficult for a pastor to break out of those narrow preconceived walls of ministry. And even some of the members may have problems if you start getting involved in business as a church. And you need to appreciate the fact that the 21st century church must be completely different from the 20th century, 20th century church if it's going to be relevant and effective. And uh, I was on Sunday morning, I was speaking to our church about our plans for this year and made an announcement. And uh, I heard myself saying this in the middle of what they call a crisis. And that is, we are about this year, we, we plan to have our ministry completely debt free. We're just about to do it. Uh, pay off everything, owe nobody, and it's happening right in the middle of what you call a downturn in the economy. And, uh, and we are able to do that because of business planning for the past 10 years. It was my goal to do it. And so we put some things in place and uh, operated as a strong business management team in the church. And uh, to take advantage of those talented people who are in that congregation as well. We, we activate everybody in our ministry. 
And I want to encourage you to really take seriously what you heard if you are a pastor and, uh, or a business person. Start thinking in terms of long-term revenue streams. Because, as you can see already, uh, when your members lose their jobs, it affects your bottom line. And you've got to be aware that you should not just be trapped by one revenue stream if you're going to carry God's work. Amen? Uh, today, I am going to talk about the subject of this conference, uh, the seminar here at Focus 2009, and uh, we've been dealing with developing kingdom strategy for changing times. I couldn't think of a more appropriate topic. I've been teaching on this all last year, about change and preparing our people to handle change effectively <clears throat> because they knew it was coming and it's still coming. And we're going to take a look at that today. Before we get into this, I'm going to ask you to take a look at the screen and just get depressed. Uh, this is five minutes from my house and I drove past this on the way to the airport. And I was wondering, what am I doing here? <clears throat> Going to Atlanta uh, where it's so freezing. But you see, this is where God lives. This is Paradise Island in the Nassau. And uh, I just thought I'd give you a little warm feeling before we get started. So you can kind of feel good about, you know, that life is not as cold as it is outside all the time. There is a place where you can come and receive some warmth. My wife told me to give you all her love. So she sent me so you can have her love. She sent her love. Um, we've been married. This is 30 years of marriage this year for my wife and I. And I uh, thank God for his faithfulness. And my family is my greatest asset, so I invest in them a lot. Just a couple of items I want to mention to you as leaders to think about. Uh, devotions for leaders. We released those brand new devotions this year. I want to recommend those to you. And a book on marriages. I'm just tired of hearing pastors fall apart. And so we wrote a specific book that deals with 35, 335 days in a year for pastors and their wives. Uh, how to have marriage devotions every morning. Marriage devotions, a different kind of devotions for married couples. We want to strengthen leaders in their relationship. So I want to recommend, it's brand new, just came out. It's regularly 29 bucks, but I think uh, we got a good deal with the, with the publishing company to ship the books here, so we get them for 20 bucks today. I want to recommend you take that home and spend that quality time with your spouse. Marriage is like a fire. You've got to keep putting logs on it. Otherwise, it can burn out. So, you've got to keep cultivating it. And our success is because we keep doing fresh things in our relationship that make us uh, effective as husband and wife. I want to recommend also some of these items to you. Uh, I'm going to speak today, actually, on one aspect of what I want to share in this concept of change. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, I'm going to speak on part two. So, uh, I'm going to kind of lay a foundation today of what we're going to talk about, the kingdom of God, and how the kingdom perceives change, how the kingdom perceives crisis, and uh, also how the kingdom wants us to live in the midst of change. I've done a lot of research in this area myself, applied the principles to my own life, and I want to recommend two important items. One of them is this new book called In Charge. This book deals with discovering your gift of leadership, your leadership gift. I couldn't have written this book until now. It took about 28 years to write this one book. Because I wanted to prove what I discovered in scripture about leadership. And I've proven it. It works, not only in my own life, but I've tested it in our organization. And I've seen hundreds of young and older people transform their lives by applying the principles that we captured in this book. Uh, this is going to be what I call the crisis proof material. You don't need to become a victim of crisis if you discover your gift. And I'm going to talk about that in the morning, especially focus on that in the morning specifically, because I want to ask you a question. It's a rhetorical question, so don't answer it. The question is, if man had never fallen, what would you be doing now? You need to think about that question.
There'd be no need for pastors. So what would you be doing? You would still be here. You would have still been working. I guess the issue is, is pastoring a gift or a function? Is there life beyond pastoring? These are questions you have to ponder. It's more important to discover your gift than to get an education. Because your education does not make room for you in the world. your gift and you have to become a discoverer of self and then be, become in charge of your gift so you can serve it to the world people don't come to you because they like you <clears throat> they come to you because they want your gift And if you don't have a clear discovery of your gift as a leader, when they get tired of you as a personality, they will leave. So I want to stir that up in you, this next two sessions that I have with you, to really work on this. The second and last recommendation I want to make is a brand new release that just came out. Two weeks ago, right here in Atlanta, it was released at the International Booksellers Convention. And they asked me to speak on this because the president of the Christian Booksellers Association <clears throat> read the manuscript. And they asked me to come and speak. I was here. It was cold then, too. I cannot stress how important it is for you to keep developing yourself as a leader. Very critical. Because <clears throat> leadership is not about techniques, it's not about methods, it's not about learning how to manipulate, control people. I noticed in this little book that I just picked up, it's a powerful little book, I just saw it for the first time, I already read it in ten minutes. This book is powerful. I, I do speed reading. And this book is amazing. Matter of fact, I hope everyone get a copy of this book. Because it really talks about coming back to not just a new approach to ministry, but it talks about getting back in order with regards to covering. Learning to submit as a leader to a leader. So you can continue to develop your leadership. It's a very powerful book. Congratulations. I wonder why it costs more than my book, because it's thick, but anyhow, it's content, I know it's content, yeah. Probably it's the photographs on the back, you know. These two guys, you get the photograph. Well, I want to recommend uh, these two books together. One of them deals with discovering your gift, the other one deals with becoming your gift. This is, read this one first, read this one second. As a leader, and if you want to train your leaders in your company or in your church, these are the kinds of materials you want to focus on. You can order them in the bookstores or direct from the publishing company. But for you, I'd like to encourage you to make sure you get your copies today. I recommend that to you. Okay, let's take a look at what we want to talk about today. Developing Kingdom Strategy for Changing Times. I'm going to focus specifically on... Kingdom laws for overcoming crisis. Everybody say that. Write that down on the top of your page. Kingdom laws for overcoming crisis. When you see the word laws in scripture, it's, it's also the same word that Jesus used for keys. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the laws by which the kingdom functions. I will give you the principles that, that cause you to operate effectively in God's culture, in God's country. 
Anytime you become a citizen of a country, you are responsible for learning the laws of the country so that you can submit to those laws and then obey the laws so that you can benefit from what the country's offerings are to you as a citizen. I want to specifically talk about in this segment how to manage and overcome crisis. Everybody knows that we are in crisis right now. Some of your churches are already feeling it in the most sensitive areas. I spoke with a pastor, wife last night. She sent me an email. My husband is in a hospital. This guy was a healthy guy. For the last two months, he's been in touch with me. I've been encouraging him. Sent him a little assistance. And he's been saying, my entire building is about to go into foreclosure. The whole church building. The bank is about to repossess. And, and he's asking help from everywhere. And now he's in the hospital. The stress level. As a pastor. What do you tell the people when you stand up on Sunday and say, you know, we got issues here. We might not be able to meet here next week. Did God fail is the question. Does this thing work? And some of you may be headed toward that kind of crisis. You put on a good face while you're here and you say amen, but you look at that offering plate and you see the reports from your financial director and you're wondering, how are we going to meet the next obligation that we have next month? It's crisis. I think we could define 2009 as the year of change. I know that when Mr. Obama began to run for president, and he said it's time for change and change, I not, I'm not sure we appreciated what this might have meant. Because from his point of view, it was a positive announcement. But now we are in the midst of a change that is not necessarily a positive experience for most of the people in the world. Yes, change is here. But change, I call it an, an equalizer. Everybody will experience change. So that makes us all equal. If you're doing well right now, don't worry about it. Your time is coming. And everyone will and must face change. Some kind of change is coming. And... I want to talk about change and its relationship to crisis. Write this down. Number one, all change is a crisis. You used to weigh 110. And now you weigh 180. That's a crisis. Why? A whole new wardrobe is required. <laughs> and a new level of mental guilt takes over your life. You got to adjust the people looking at you differently. And sometimes they may comment. In other words, just that simple change is a crisis. You had a baby, that's a crisis. It's a wonderful thing, but it's a crisis. Because now everything changes in the house. For some of you, you had a grandbaby, that's a crisis. Because you want everybody to see the photograph, that's a crisis. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> crisis is a result of change. And some crises are self-produced. I mentioned one already. You eat uncontrollably. You create a change that can become a crisis. You eat the wrong thing for a period of time. It can become a crisis. You can self-impose that crisis. Number four, an external crisis is a result of changes over which you had no control. And this is where the whole country is in the midst of right now. And your ministry or your business happen to be in that environment. Number five, the greatest result of crisis is change. Things that we used to do five years ago, we can't do them anymore right now. Even some of your plans that you had for 2009 and 2010 are no longer valid. 
You had planned to add on to your church or to build another parking lot or to pave a certain area or to buy property. And here comes economic crisis. You got to revamp the whole plan and in some cases even cancel it or postpone it. Why? Because change is a product of crisis. Number six, very important. Mastering the changes of crisis is determined by your ability to manage and benefit from change. This is very important. Your success at this time in your life for the next three years will be determined by your capacity, your ability, and your capability to manage change and also to benefit from it. And sometimes that's difficult to do. I'm going to show you some of the important principles that you can apply to not just manage change, but to benefit from it and even thrive in the midst of it. I plan to have one of the best years of my life this year. Because I have understood some specific principles that are consistent in the kingdom culture that makes change a benefit and you capitalize on change in kingdom culture. Let's talk about what is a crisis. I have a picture of here. What do you see? A tornado. A tornado is a crisis. What's a crisis? Well, let's write it down. A crisis is an event, a circumstance, or a situation affecting you or your environment over which you have no direct cause, control, or responsibility. This is very important to write down. You should go back and read this to your organization because they need to understand that you didn't cause this. And you are not responsible for it. And you may not be able to control it at all. You cannot stop a hurricane. You cannot control a tornado. So you better prepare yourself to adapt, adjust, and effectively ride that experience. So that's what makes it a crisis. The crisis is a crisis, and I'm talking about the kind we're in now, because you didn't cause it, didn't expect it, and can't control it. And that makes it a crisis. Now, what do you do when you are in the midst of a crisis? You got to write fast. First of all, you are always in control of one thing, and that is your mind. You cannot control the wind, you cannot control the hurricane, you cannot control the tornado, you cannot control the economic global crisis right now, you cannot control companies shutting down, you cannot control the layoffs, but you can control how you think about them. And this is very important because your mentality and your thoughts are necessary in order to interpret and respond effectively to the crisis. This is very critical. I am going to see now, in this period, who are the true leaders. Crisis will reveal true leadership. And it will expose the fake leadership. True leaders don't panic in crisis. They plan. They don't lose control in crisis. They manage. Therefore, how you think is more important than what happens around you. I put it another way. And that is, Whatever you call or label a thing, that is what it becomes to you. Please write that down. Whatever you call or label a thing, that's what it becomes to you. I used to tell people years ago that I have problems. 
I don't do that anymore. I always say now, I have opportunities to grow. Whenever something happens in my life that I didn't expect or cannot control, my thought patterns are, this is an opportunity for me to test some untapped abilities, to use some skills I never used before. This has come to draw on hidden potentials in me that I never had the chance to use before. It is a positive. Number two, whatever a thing is to you controls your response to it. I'm sure you realize that suicide rates are going up. I've already been touched by it in my own organization. And some of you are going to experience this. People won't know how to respond to the crisis because their thoughts will interpret the crisis in a different way and their response will be according to their interpretation. Number three, responding to crisis. Controlled perception is not denial of reality. But it is the control of your response to reality. In other words, don't go around saying it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Economic problems do exist. People are losing their jobs. Houses are in foreclosure. Your church might be brought up to the bank in question. You might lose some members. There will be some problems. That's reality. But you must control how you think about all of that. When you read the scriptural text, you'll find that God many times would break in on humans at the point of crisis. And he would say things to them like, be not afraid. Why? They were beginning to interpret the environment as a purpose for fear. Because if your thoughts become a victim of the circumstance, the circumstance wins. And as leaders, you cannot allow the environment to control you. The people are looking for you to take them through it. Number four, crisis is not really a real problem, you know. It's how you interpret it. Crisis is simply a change in the environment that demands a new, unscheduled response. You didn't plan on this. So you got to respond in a way that you didn't plan to respond. The crisis, therefore, is an environment that develops that you couldn't control, you didn't create, but you got to live in it. So you must decide, how am I going to respond? Crisis, therefore, demands an unscheduled response. It may even demand, and you're going to find this out in a few minutes, a response you never had before. It may demand a word that I will use in a few minutes a lot, and that's the word innovation. Innovative thinking. Because situations usually come into your life to help you discover a person you never knew living inside of you. To help you think thoughts you never thought before. Crises are good for expanding mental exercise. In good times, we do not think. And this is why God allows challenges. You know, uh, write this down, very important. Crisis is the source of creativity. I am telling you, ladies and gentlemen, in the next 18 months, there will be the greatest inventions in the 21st century. This century is going to begin with creativity at a level we had never seen for a long time. I heard the gentleman stand in the meeting a moment ago showing us cups and plates. Made out of things, you're still trying to figure out how they did that. Because when there is crisis, it creates creativity. 
You may have to develop a church mentality you ain't never had before to keep church now. You got to do some things that you never thought a church would do in order to fulfill the assignment God gave you because of crisis. Write this down. You never grow in good times. The human brain is designed for demands to be placed on it. You know, I was intrigued when I was a teenager. I would read the Bible through every year as a teenager. Every year. I still do it. But I started as a teenager. And when I was reading the Bible in my early teenage years, I discovered this thing in the book of Genesis where God created Adam as an adult. Adam had no upbringing, no parents, no experience. He had no history. He just appeared as an adult, as far as the text tells us. And therefore, Adam was created and never activated his brain. So what does God do? In order for the, the brain to be activated, God created a crisis. He said, name every animal. And then God walked off. In other words, God will give you a demand to reveal your ability. Now we're going to see if you really are a pastor. We're going to see if that title bishop means anything to that community now. We're going to see if your church is going to survive. We're going to see if you got the ability to respond to something that's bigger than the whole community. How are you going to make it? You know, I was thinking about this, this element of change in crisis. And you may want to note this. Nothing is as permanent as change. The only thing in life you can depend on is change. That's important. Because change is constant. Sometimes I am amazed when people are shocked about things that are supposed to be expected. Like change. Some of you are having prayer meetings and binding the devil and loosing the devil. And then just, listen, this is a cycle. Well, this thing, the, devil, the devil ain't done this. It's a cycle. It's an economic cycle. All bubbles burst. We just happen to be alive and this one did. So now we're going to see how do you respond to change. Write this down, please. Everything changes. Say it. Everything Say it a little bit louder. Everything How about a little louder? Everything Say it a little bit louder. Everything, Everything changes. Changes. How many things? Everything. Everything. Your spouse will change. Your kids are going to leave you. Your house will fall apart. Everything changes. Your closest members of your church will eventually leave you. You will not have money all the time. Everything changes. And so the critical thing you got to appreciate is that change is just life. It's a part of life. It's, and the reason why I have developed such peace in my life for the last 30 years, just having a good time with perfect blood pressure, is because I figured it out. Everything changes. Now, once you clear it in your mind that everything changes, then what you have to do for the rest of your life is to organize your life in such a way that change never surprises you. How do you do that? I thought I would put this in. As leaders, we forget this. Everybody say the promise. 
God promised us change. <laughs> and that sounds simple, but you, you still ain't got it yet. God promised change. Here's what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He said, to, to everything, there's only a season. Church bursting at the seam. Everybody's coming. Parking lot for God. said, listen, enjoy this season. Church falling apart. People leaving. God said, handle this season. Everything. Whether it's less or more. High or low. Big or small. God says, it's only a season. Everything. If you broke now, just wait it out. That's the good part of seasons. To every purpose, there's just a time. In other words, everything in life is seasonal. So the key to life is waiting out the season effectively. And that's what the smart business people are doing. You know, the guy who wrote the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, was on Larry King last night. And he was talking. And I'm sitting there thinking, I like this guy. He said, man, this is the best time to invest. And why? He said, because I prepared for this time, he said. That's what he told Larry King. I prepared for this time. Those who panic are those who didn't prepare. So what I'm doing now in my own personal businesses, my companies, is we are buying a property everywhere now. We're investing in real estate. Our church is buying a property. Why? We were prepared. How do we go debt free in the middle of a crisis? This is our debt free year. We're going to pay everything off. Why? We prepared for 10 years for this. Interest rates are perfect for me. You panicking, I'm planning. Why? Because when you understand that it's seasonal, you prepare for the next season. You know, when, when Egypt went into crisis, economic crisis, and by the way, the word crisis in the Bible is the word famine. Joseph did what? He stored up against the hard years. What have you stored up in your ministry? Make a note here, please. The promise that God made to us. He says, as long as the earth remains, there will be what? Seed time and harvest. Cold and heat. Right now it's cold, isn't it? I'm not talking about the weather either. This is economic winter right now. God promised you. He says, as long as the earth remains, there will be cold and heat. There will be summer and winter, day and night. They will never cease. For some people, this is a long night right now. And when you go back to your ministry as a pastor, for example... Take this message back to them. You, you can go ahead and preach this message. This is what saved my church. I'm still saving them. Look, this is night for some of you. But the good news is, day coming. And for your ministry, for some of you, you may be in the middle of night. And you're thinking, God, did you leave me? No. He said there'll be night. But it's dark. Yeah, but it's only night. It looks gloomy. It's only night. And so the power of leadership is the capacity to live out the night. Bring the people through the night. Because day is on the way. Daniel 20, 2 verse 20 says, Praise the name of the Lord God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. I, that was interesting. It, it puts the responsibility on God. God brings in seasons. And God takes them out. Economic crisis. God says, yes. You know, I was teaching for the last four months on crisis in the church just to get the mentality of people corrected. And I went in to study Joseph again. And I found a statement I never saw before. It says, and the Lord God said to Pharaoh through Joseph, there'll be seven years of famine, seven years of plenty. It says, and the Lord has revealed this to Pharaoh 
For the Lord has decided to do this and no one will stop it. That's a serious statement. In other words, God says, look, I'm going to bring crisis and it ain't Wall Street's fault. God took responsibility for the season. We love to blame people. You've got to find someone to blame. But I'm in New Zealand last week and they're not blaming Wall Street. I was in London two weeks ago. They're not blaming Wall Street. Something just happened. We're not sure what happened. But everything just went out of control. Every institution we depended on has been shaken. And the only thing that isn't shaken is the kingdom of God. And that might be the purpose for the shaking. God says, I will do this to Pharaoh so that he may know that I, the Lord, I am God. In other words, God shook the whole economy of Egypt for the reason that we don't think about. He said, I want Pharaoh to know that he ain't God. So now we depend on the federal government, depend on state government, we depend on them to bring employment. God, I'm going to shake everything until everybody stop looking at each other. Start looking up. I put it to you then that to face change, you need to think a certain way. Number one, the greatest protection against change is to expect it. Can you say it out loud with me? Say it. The greatest, the greatest protection against change is to expect it. This is going to sound real weird to some of you, but I buried my wife already. I buried her a long time. I went through her funeral in my mind. Just in case. I buried my son and daughter already. I went through the funeral. I already thought what I would think, how I would deal with it. I went through the whole thing. Why? Just in case. I buried my father already. He's 84 years old. I already went to the funeral, already made arrangements. I got it all figured out. How am I going to deal with it? Why? Just in case. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. Jesus said to his disciples, They will kill me. They will crucify me. They will bury me. They're going to pull my beard out and spit in my face. He told them bad stuff. He says, I told you this so that when it happens, you will not be offended. Wow! He's preparing them for change. You know why most of us are depressed? We didn't expect to ever have to, to think about offerings fallen. So we are offended. Now, can you imagine when Christ was arrested, Peter was going to be like one of us, start praying, I bind the devil, you lose Jesus, let him go, leave my master alone, come out. Christ said, look, I told you they're going to arrest me. I to in, in other words, it's negative, but I told you. Prepare your church for hard times. Sometimes the fake message that we've been preaching have been the source of the depression in the people's lives. And I've come to tell you, adjust your message of faith. Teach them the kind of faith which says, O oh Nebuchadnezzar, our Lord is able to deliver us. But if He that's the kind of faith you need. Yeah. See, you didn't teach them that. What if you don't keep your house? What if you don't get healed? He says, we will still trust him. Clap right there, pastors.
Tell your neighbor, expect change. Yeah. Number two, write this down. The greatest source of disappointment in anyone's life is the expectation of things remaining the same. That's the source of your disappointment. I think our friend, Brother Gary Oliver, you had a tragedy in your family, didn't you? Yeah? And I'm sure he could tell you, no expectation. You go home, skipping, whistling, everything's fine. Uh, you just kind of expect Monday to be like Tuesday. Jesus rehearsed his death for three and a half years. And he even repeated it verbally. Just so that he could get prepared and his friends. You need to start telling your church these kinds of things. I won't be with y'all always. I dare you. The first meeting Jesus had with his disciples shocked me. You got to go back and read the Bible. It's amazing stuff. And I always think leadership when I read the Bible is leadership. Here he is. He's having his first meeting with his first team. First meeting. And the meeting has one thing on the agenda. Only one item was on the agenda. First meeting. They're brand new. They're just knowing, getting to know each other. Brand new group. And his first meeting was one thing on the agenda. Death. He began the whole day by saying, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be crucified. In other words, before we get started, let me get you used to thinking with me not being here. And I've done that with my church when we started. I said, I'll never forget that. I told the church, I want you to get used to me not being here. Believe in the vision more than the visionary. Because the Bible never says without a leader, the people perish. You are dispensable, brother. People will first come to you. Your job is to transfer their allegiance to the vision. Because the vision will outlive you. And you must not allow them to become attached to you. Because you could change just like that. Dead in the morning. Write this down, please. The greatest protection against disappointment is the expectation of change. This is why so many people are having depression, heartache, and I'm talking about pastors and bishops and reverends and elders as well. Losing it mentally now because they never thought that the pastor would have to put his house up to keep the church. And I've had two pastors who had to put their house on the market to save the church. Can that happen to you? It's possible. So at least think it first. Think, what will I do? What will I do if God doesn't deliver me from the fire? Can I meet the fourth man in the furnace? That's the kind of faith you need. Is this good? You're all quiet, boy, I tell you. Alright, let me give you something to think about before we head toward the end here for the first segment. The only thing that is unchanging is God. Is that true? Absolutely. Two things that never change. Now, this is going to be a little trick. I'm going to give you a little trick lesson here. The only two things that we know doesn't change are God. But also, the second one is his promises. Now, everything else changes. God doesn't change. His promises never change. That creates a problem. Yes, here's the trick question. Okay? If God never changes, just 
buy the CD. And his, <laughs> and his promises never changes. Then we know that nothing is permanent except God and his promises. But here's the problem. God's promises also include that nothing is permanent. Are you getting this message? It's very important. His promise never changed and he promised you everything is only for a season. That's a promise. So, you got to accept that promise like every other promise. Okay? You are passing the church now. Great. God said, look, enjoy your time. Why? I might move you. Not everything is permanent. He promised change. Sometimes we say, well, you know, how can that guy who has been with me all these years tell me one morning God told him to leave? I, I poured my life into him. I gave him so much. I trained him. God said, wait a minute. Slow down. I promised you. Everything is a season. Hmm. So the economy is collapsing. All these businesses shutting down in your neighborhood. Your members ain't got no more salary. They can't pay tithes. And now you can't keep the air condition and the light bill paid. And you're sitting there going, devil. God said, no, God. Are we doing something wrong? Are we sinning? Maybe the pastor's in evil. No. Season. Testing leadership. God is not a capitalist. And God has no interest in the American dream. So don't make your dream God's dream. Most of the leaders in the church in, in, in this day would never survive the Old Testament God. They couldn't even compete with the New Testament God. Paul wrote the New Testament. The guy is God's number one man. God says, yep, but you're still going to jail. <laughs> what kind of faith do you have? When you go back to your church, go back with the balance of revelation that God is still with us. He is with us in the dark as he was in the light. I had dinner, I mean lunch with Corey Ten Boom some years ago when I was the missions director at Old Roberts University. And uh, she always came in every year to speak to the missions conference that we didn't have in. And I went to lunch with this legend. And, you know, when you are around people with great knowledge and experience, you shouldn't talk much. You listen. And you ask questions. So I, I sat there. I had a privilege of sitting with history. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get everything I can from this woman. And I asked questions for one hour. At the end of my questions, which was like sitting in a university classroom for an hour. I asked her the final question. I said, what would you advise a young man who wants to do something with his life? For God. She said, broken Dutch. She said, Miles, you know, I will tell you this. Number one, grow where you are planted. Number two, Believe in the dark. What he told you in the light. And lunch was over. I went back to my dorm room, sat on my bed and wept. And I said, God, teach me that. Change. Ecclesiastes 3 again repeats it to everything. It's just a season. So what we're going through at the moment, you leaders, be encouraged. Take the people through it. You're coming out the other side. 
Can I suggest to you, James 1.16 says, Don't be deceived, my dear brother. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, who does not change. He's permanent. Sure, that's true. But what about this one? Psalm 145 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to what? All of His promises, and even though He's loving toward all He has made. Now, we say God loves us, and He's faithful to the promise He made us, but He has a promise. He made this promise to us, Genesis 8. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time. There will be cold and heat, summer and winter. We always want summer. We always want heat. We always want harvest. God says, no, there will be night and day. Ezekiel said it this way, 34, 26. I will bless them and the places are surrounding my hill. I